<laughs> everything started with our main podcast uh, channel four uh, that kind of united the others and that's how mm-hmm. um we were managed yeah, yeah we, we had some we have some small small budget for uh, for uh lecturers and presenters and yeah that's how we we report them at the end with the recording and with some uh meeting notes from our meeting so technically okay. that's the, <laughs> the okay. sort of project <laughs> okay all right sounds good thank you of course no i can uh continue with just speaking um i think it's much more effective to have a conversation so i can uh talk i will talk a little bit about um how we started um and how we ended up becoming a podcast festival um i'll also talk about some examples um that really inspired us um because you mentioned in your email that you are looking kind of globally what are people doing with podcast festivals so i can share um a little bit uh, of what inspired us to start and i will talk a, a little bit more about building community because um you can find all kinds of articles and webinars about how to optimize your podcast how to do like lots of technical things but um it's something that we found that even if you invest in your podcast but you don't really invest in building community um then you know it's just really fun but it doesn't really connect with other people um and so I'll talk a little bit about that so I'll I'll get started okay. um so for those of you who are in the call thank you very much for the invitation um my name is Josephine so Josephine Karian Jahi Karian Jahi is my last name Josephine is my first name and i am a co-founder at africa podfest so the full name is africa podcast festival and we started it in 2019 uh november we had this great idea that uh we would be you know we we wanted to have our podcast festival in a 2020 march so um but a little bit before i get into the podcast festival i'll tell you how i got started into podcasting Um I currently I'm in uh Germany. I live in Düsseldorf, Germany and I work here as well as a remote consultant. Uh, my background is in communications and public health and advocacy and media. And so I spent um my early uh years uh working on different projects which are focused on the African continent which touch those areas. And so um I worked with for example a film project that was focused on bringing films to girls about education girls in schools um and other institutions in Kenya and that was across Kenya so it reaching about 20 million people uh in Kenya through this project um other projects that have been part of have included media in one way or another uh including uh traditional traditional radio I developed a radio show um regarding the same project that I spoke about and this radio show was a weekly radio show which produced inspirational stories i heard um somebody here talk about inspirational stories being part of your podcast so we managed uh in that uh, project to do some inspirational stories about different uh, entrepreneurs and then we broadcast them in a kenyan radio station uh over 10 weeks and each week we would reach about a million people and so in this background um i was very interested in ways that we can connect different communities with media and when i moved to germany to continue exploring the world of careers the world of uh, learning um and also to pursue new projects i was really interested in podcasting because um initially while i was learning german i did not have much interaction with the media and so tv programs radio programs podcasts in german were not connecting with me so they were everywhere you know you could get them on whatsapp you could get them on various platforms so i looked for english language podcasts because you could walk around with your headphones in your ears if you're doing your day to day live um and i could also hear people who had um interesting topics that i was interested in as well as from anywhere in the world and so that was very exciting to me as a podcaster Now for all of you you know that the minute you start listening to podcasts and start getting ideas about your own podcast I started getting ideas about how I could start becoming a podcaster and so here in my own little kitchen with my headphones and my mobile phone I was like this is the way I'm going to record my first podcast that was back in 2018 
And I realized that the, my two worlds could collide. I could uh, focus on my region, which is Africa. And also I could focus on podcasting. And also I was very fortunate that I have uh, two co-founders who we started Africa Podfest with who are also interested. One was a radio producer who was switching into podcasting. And the other one was an IT consultant who was switching into podcasting research as well. And so there's something there about uh, starting something with your friends uh, that really was exciting to me, energizing to me. And when um, I started putting out my podcast, I, I sent them out to family and friends first. Of course, the safe audience is always people you know in your network. And then I realized that I didn't know enough about podcasting and I needed to create a new awareness about podcasts within my network and beyond my network. So I needed to gain technical knowledge. I needed to find other people who are also interested in my region of focus, my, my topics of focus. And I also found that a lot of people who are already making podcasts, some of them even 10 years had been podcasting, 15 years had been, you know, like really long time in podcasting. They were doing it as an isolated project. And so they didn't really have a network um, in, the, uh, in Africa or the African diaspora, which is really important to me. And so we started by having um, a series of events in Nairobi in 2019. We had uh, the unconference on podcasting. So the unconference um, followed the format of, um, you know, a very informal gathering of very serious podcasters who are based in Nairobi. And that in that case, uh, Nairobi is quite international. We had podcasters from many countries who are based in Nairobi. We had people who are from Kenya who are based in Nairobi who have podcasts. And we found some people also who are not podcasters, but maybe they work in the ad industry or in traditional media, so radio, television, print. And also we found a lot of students who are interested in um, creating their own podcasts. So the first gathering, we had a full house, we had a really great time, and we decided to have another one in December of 2019. And for that, we got our first sponsor. We, it was a sponsored event. Uh, and we had a small grant to uh, create our first, uh, the second and conference on podcasting. So we were really excited. Uh, of course, we had no idea what was happening in the world around us. Uh, none of us really did. And so we started making arrangements to have an all Africa podcast festival. To prepare for that, um, in 2020, uh, we decided that actually we need to create some brand awareness about African podcasts. And so our company invented what's called Africa Podcast Day every year on the 12th of February, which is um, now every year we celebrate African podcasters on this day. It's important to note that we didn't ask anybody for permission. We didn't um, have any support um, from any organization apart from ourselves. We just thought this is a great idea. We want to raise awareness. We want to build community. And so let's have this Africa Podcast Day. And we had the first Africa Podcast Day as a community gathering in a small cafe uh, in Kenya. And the beautiful thing about this is that the cafe had arranged the tables around, you know how typically in a, in a restaurant they had separate tables. And immediately when the podcasters came into the room, they immediately took apart this configuration and created one big table and created chairs around this table. And we hadn't said anything about this is how you should sit or this is how you should interact. But it was kind of that organic nature of um, people wanting to connect, not having had any other forum before that. And it was really exciting because they immediately just started sharing what's working for their podcast, what's not working for their podcast. They started thinking of collaborations. They actually found that they had much in common. And, you know, what they did, you know, what we did was we said, you know, to the cafe, let people just kind of buy a coffee or whatever and, you know, give us the space. And they were very kind and gave us the space for free. So this idea of the Africa Podcast Day, the first 30 people who came together for Africa Podcast Day in Nairobi really excited us and made us even more motivated to develop the Africa Podcast Festival concept. So a podcast festival is many things. Uh, for us, we wanted it to be a knowledge base where people could learn about podcasting. We wanted it to be a, a, a forum for people to launch their podcasts and share new information about their podcasts. And we also wanted people to kind of celebrate the work that they put into their podcasts and be part of a community and connect with people, whether for commercial purposes or for community building purposes. And sometimes those are interlinked. And so we found that 
um, we were very excited that people actually bought tickets. Um, the tickets at that time were about uh, 3,000 Kenya shillings, which at the time was about 30 US dollars per person for the day. And this was huge because it, we, there was no festival at the time, yet people were buying tickets and they were spreading the word. We were doing radio appearances. We were talking to people um, and we were doing kind of giveaways for the tickets. We, were, um, we had a huge roster of speakers. You can still find um, a lot of their information on africapodcastfestival.com. So we actually created this whole program Unfortunately, one week before the launch of the program, um, the government in Kenya, uh, like many governments around the world, um, limited the kinds of gatherings that could take place. And so they said, if you're having a gathering of international guests, which we were having, you have to have only 15 people, one five. And so um, that, that made us cancel everything. So we, that Friday, it was a, the Friday before, we canceled everything and we um, had to return all the you know booking money we had to return all the ticket money you don't have to do this but we were like we had the trust of our community and we did we knew that maybe people might want to use that money in this new weird world we are starting and so the the genesis of having that festival made us really think about um how can we build trust with our community how can we yes we, we took a huge financial hit but also people really uh, built a respect for us because they said you respect my 30 dollars you respect my time, you respect my commitment. So I'm part of this community. And I think that's an important point. So um, when we canceled this festival, the big shift, and I think you might have seen a little bit more of this, is we started creating virtual uh, programming. So from that festival, we created a couple of virtual sessions, uh, panels where we recorded, and this was very early in the days of like remote. So the Zoom wasn't great, the tech wasn't great, but at least we had panelists who were willing to try and connect with us. And we had a couple of recordings for the first Africa Podcast Festival in 2020. We then took a huge break and decided to pivot towards um, virtual programming because of course we couldn't travel to other countries ourselves. Um, I was in Kenya initially in March, 2020, but they announced uh, soon after that, that they were going to close the airspace. So I had to choose if I was going to come back to my home here in Germany, or I was going to stay in Kenya, um, you know, kind of to wait for the end of whatever this is, whatever this pandemic is. And so um, we got a lot of emails after that, uh, reaching out to us and saying, hey, can you create something for us to um, celebrate what we're doing? Can you create any kind of platform for us um, that would help us uh, become more uh, visible? So we sat back down and we developed um, our kind of mission statement. What do we want to do? So we knew that in traditional media, there's only a very specific type of person who is heard. Typically, this person has access to resources. Uh, maybe they have advanced education. Maybe they're from a dominant um, you know, um, regional uh, area in the country. Maybe they speak a dominant language. Um, mostly men um, you know, are the main talking heads, figures, reference points in media. And also it's very few people who actually get fairly paid to um, be part of traditional media. And so it's a very small group of people who are representing the whole population. So we really wanted to make sure that more people were represented. And by representation, we mean everybody who is not on current traditional media. So um, women, uh, youth, um, I, I don't know if, if this is familiar to you, but across Africa, about 75% of the population is under 25 years old. But when you look at traditional media, you don't see them. In podcasting, it's an overarching you know, group that you know, is youth. So we wanted to make sure that youth were represented. We wanted also um, people who come from minority groups. So any minority you can think of, um, people who come from low income, very low income settlements, people who um, are not traditional journalists. They don't have any journalism background. People who um, come from uh, refugee and migrant groups. So we wanted to make sure that we created a platform which a small independent podcaster from an underrepresented group who is part of the Africa or African diaspora can actually find a place for themselves, can find community and also can find connections. We were very fortunate that um, our virtual events got picked up by uh, Google Podcast Creators Program. 
So in December of 2020, we did um, a diff we did a program for them that was helping people understand how to build community. That's still up um, on their website. Um, and also we we had an opportunity to think really critically about how to do a virtual Africa Podcast Festival in 2021. Um, about a couple of weeks before Africa Podcast Festival 2021, we were approached by CNN and they said that they want to tell the story of African podcasting. So they asked us if they could come and follow us around while we were preparing for Africa Podcast Festival and if they could develop a program based on African podcasters in Kenya, Nigeria and South Africa. And so we connected them with different podcasters and they sent out their crews to these different countries to create this awareness about podcasting and to broadcast what we were doing for Africa Podcast Festival 2021. It was really, really kind of weird for us because uh, they, uh, I was still here in Germany uh, doing a virtual presentation, doing virtual moderation. And so I had a live link um, to somebody at CNN uh, my co-founders in Nairobi, Melissa, and she had um, a live link as well. So she had about three different microphones following her around, three different crews, um, just capturing the whole day. So it was really strange for our very small, I mean, literally very small group to be put on this global platform. But it was also very wonderful because a lot of people started to kind of think about why they hadn't heard any African podcasts and why they should actually be part of communities where they can hear alternative perspectives. So we really made sure that this was a central part of our conversation. And it was huge for us to have so many people uh, join us virtually to connect with the idea. We had um, people, you know, pledge to fund the 2022 Africa Podcast Festival from this uh, show uh, that CNN did. We also found that a lot of people were really looking for genuine connection, like in the podcast community globally, even people who maybe they work for very large companies or they have very huge budgets. They also were asking the same question that you're asking, you know, kind of how do you build community and how do you proceed? Um, so when we were trying to develop the concept around the, the festival, we looked at um, different authors who have written about gatherings. How do you gather intentionally? How do you create intentional gatherings? How do you make sure that you put people front and center when you gather? Um, and so there's a really great book called The Art of Gathering, which came out around the pandemic um, because people were doing a lot of remote gatherings for family, friends, and their communities. And so we learned from those examples. We also talked to other festival organizers in the US, um, in Australia, we talked to people um, who were also developing their own concepts in other parts of Africa. So we got in touch with uh, people developing a podcast, uh, podcast in Cairo, uh, people who are organizing podcasters in Nigeria, South Africa, people who are podcasting from all over, um, whether they had a budget or not. So we started getting hundreds of emails of people just really reaching out to us to talk about podcasting. And it was really wonderful. Um, and we started thinking about how to make proper structures so that we could create a business that uh, would allow us to do podcast production, that would also allow us to create good events that were um, really well-funded. And also we wanted to continue doing research. So the research story comes from my uh, co-founder. She had started doing some research back in 2018 about what uh, trends are happening in podcasting in Kenya. And she expanded this research when we joined forces to, to be part of Africa PodFest. And she started um, and she created a lot of internal structures that allowed us to create quantitative surveys of how many people are listening, how do you know who is listening to your podcast, why are people listening in specific regions. And we released our um, research as open access. And we were asked, you know, why aren't you selling your uh, research? You know, why, do you, why don't you have a paywall for it? Um, and just to help you give you context, these are there's so many people who've been collecting this data and they never release it for the African continent. So a lot of people contacted us after we posted our research on our website, podcasting.africa, and said, yeah, we've been seeing these things internally for the last two to three years. Um, good job on putting it out there. We agree, you know, we validate your findings. And we found that a lot of people are waiting for the opportunity of podcasting to become a commercially viable idea, but they're not really willing to contribute anything to build it as well. And so you find there's a lot of people with the tools that we need. So they have the knowledge, they have the networks, they have the um, financing, 
but we still haven't found uh, enough financing, enough people who are willing to do kind of experimental financing or you know, develop kind of new models across Africa that would allow us to really you know, scale out the full range of our ideas. And so we end up doing a lot of fundraising from individual um, people who support us on an individual level. So they, you know, people who um, are part of the grants network of media grant makers, and they also have, you know, some idea that this is a good concept. And we also have um, a sense of, you know, what the commercial opportunity is, because we've been developing podcasts now that are focused on Africa. We developed the first uh, UN African podcast, which is called Africa Renewal Podcast. We've also um, decided to make our own podcast, which talks about what's happening in the African podcast ecosystem. And in to, do, to develop our own podcast, we decided to make it a partnership where we would partner with a podcast platform, partner with um, a production house so that we could show people that, yes, you, you, can, you have to pay for all these services, but you can actually develop partnerships that help you kind of mitigate some of these costs. If the, if the, if the product that you have is really adding uh, to the public space, you can actually develop these partnerships. Um, and so I will stop there for now um, because I can talk so much about uh, our journey, but I really want to prioritize your questions and maybe some of the things that maybe jumped at you from what I've shared about the festival. And uh, just a small note to tell you that um, this year we had to cancel the podcast festival entirely because at the last minute, um, major funders pulled out. That was um, in December 2022. And so we actually had to cancel it for this year. Uh, but the beautiful thing is that many people in different African countries contacted us and said, um, we're really sorry to hear that you canceled the festival. We were hoping to join you in Nairobi, but hey, can we uh, have our own festival or our own celebration? in Zambia, in Uganda, in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Kenya. And so we shared the visual, um, the brand of the Africa Podcast Day, and we uh, used our network to amplify these gatherings. And so there was still Africa Podcast Day. Um, that's when we decided to have the festival. But the important lesson is, you know, if you continue to build, people will build with you. Um, and I'll stop there for now. Uh, thank you so much. I first want to share maybe that I really relate to what you said. First of all, that we also, I mean, our media, our grant media are also very traditional. I mean, when you speak about representation, it's very hard to see yourself on the screen or, you know, to see some of the social issues and marginalized communities that are present anywhere here in Bulgaria. So I think that this is was also one of the inspirations why we really wanted to unite as a social podcast creator so we can maybe talk about these common challenges that we face and see how we can reach our audience better and actually make a kind of a better product for them uh and uh, i think that i i that came to my mind uh, because um, i think uh, for us what we've been struggling a lot with from the very beginning is that um um it's very hard to find when 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 you create content that is not so much into the mainstream like it's it's more independent it comes to like more vulnerable more like marginalized causes uh it's very hard to find uh, maybe a, a revenue streams and i i heard you that you mentioned that uh, uh, because of your community uh, you also uh reach out sometimes to individual donations and uh, people who support you and support your work but uh, is it appropriate for you to share with us whether uh let's say that there are some public programs in africa that support this kind of development or it's more like on the private sector um so so the i guess the question is so individual contribution is a very i think it's very popular in for example at different markets so eu you have a lot of people who have um kind of platform for people to send them money or you can have um you can monetize your podcast using various platforms for example, Acast, um, and you know, you can find ad companies that connect with your market, right? Uh, but for the African continent, if you can imagine, um, we have spent the last three years convincing people who have marketing budgets that they should spend money on podcasts. Like literally on calls like, you know, on um, people who have uh, events, people who uh, work in grants, like we literally have gone the whole range. We do training uh, for different organizations on um, how to 
think about podcasting, why are podcasts important in Africa? Why should you, you know, who is listening to podcasts? Why should you, you know, creating really demand for this. Um, and so slowly now we are starting to see commercial entities start to sponsor uh, podcast events. So there's a group that is uh, doing an African uh, podcast award. It's called the African Podcast and Voice Awards. It started in 2022. And this year, for the first time, a, a major commercial bank sponsored that uh, one of their events that's leading up to the awards. And it was so huge because we haven't seen major commercial entities. So, for example, telecoms companies, banks, you know, the people who should be sponsoring um, some of these events and uh, gatherings, they haven't actually made major investments. But the funny thing is, um, you know, you still find that a lot of people want to support you. So whenever you have an event that has tickets, a lot of podcasters will sell tickets to a live recording. And that's one of the ways that they get their revenue. And so, for example, um, you know, I found people who do, um, you know, they'll do a show offline and then have a Q&A with the audience. And people will pay to be in that space and they will actually have some income through that. And then others have merchandise that they sell at these events and that's uh, part of their rev revenue stream. But this is still very new. Um, and we find even people who have very good downloads, very high listenership, maybe they're even award-winning, um, at least in our region, they're still not yet, um, you know, they're not at profitability. So even if they have some income, they're not yet at the point where it's it's making sense for their podcast. And it's important to note this. Yes, I remember. Uh, I mean, because we, we also have a... a for the last three years, we've been having a podcast festival here in Bulgaria. And I remember that it also had one offline edition just after the pandemics. And there was this opportunity to have some of the material of the content offline. This was maybe uh, one of the first times in my life that I actually saw that you can pay for a content that can, after that, you download it and you can listen uh, to it, not not like in real time. So that was very interesting for me to to think about as a solution for, uh, for what you're doing. And maybe mm -hmm. I can also ask because uh, you mentioned uh, that you know you you've been building with your community and uh, that really resonates. I mean, I can see in some of your practice that uh, you, you you try to be very honest and very open with them. And I've just been wondering, uh, let's say for the content that you build for the events and for the trainings, do you usually? I mean, do you do some research uh, according to their opinions, or uh, how do you choose the topics or how the, the content that you you produce and provide? Is there some interaction? or you just go, let's say, with some of the tendencies and the issues that you identified with the context, just how this process of curation happens for you? Um, so in terms of uh, curating your festival, um, what we've decided to do is to balance between our own interests. So we are always interested in um, new models that are working across the continent. So um, one year we focused on people who have distribution through WhatsApp. And we found podcasters who were distributing their podcasts through WhatsApp. And we talked about why they decided to distribute through WhatsApp. Um, what was, you know, did they have any support from the major platforms? Why did they decide to distribute? And what they said was, they said that they asked their audience, where do you listen to your podcast? And um, they don't listen to Google Podcasts or Spotify or Apple or these kind of major podcast platforms. They said, you know, if I log into a website and there's an audio there, I listen to it there. I don't have a particular podcast platform. And so they asked them, so what do you use for news? And they said, um, I use WhatsApp, I use Telegram, I use all these other platforms. And so from there, the podcasters who we talked to for our programming uh, said that they developed their audience reach outreach based on that feedback. And so it was really interesting to us to have this content. We also realized that um, when curating that we need to have a space where people can apply to be part of the program. So what we do is we mix. So we have um, a theme for the year and we do a call out and we say, um, hey, can you do, um, you know, if you have a theme, uh, a thematic kind of linkage with this area. So, and it's a very broad theme. So, for example, uh, our last one was podcasting is freedom. Please let us know if you have a session 
that is about this, you know, kind of podcasting is freedom theme. And so we invite people to be part of the programming, but then we also kind of keep the thematic area very specific um, and try and match the submissions to that theme. So if you kind of just want to come as a, I don't know, just some people just don't do that. They don't match your theme. They just kind of want a platform, but then it doesn't, it doesn't match with the day. And they're sometimes very upset, but we don't choose all of the selections. But again, because of time and because of thinking really critically about will these topics and these uh, sessions match very well with what we're trying to do, uh, we don't want to waste your time if you're coming for this event. We want to make sure that it all connects together. And so we do a mix of our own curation. So we do some invitational sessions and we also do some, um, you know, some sessions where we we develop the sessions and um, and ask people who we've kind of interacted with or we've spoken to or who have inspired us to be part of the program as well. I have a, another type of uh, question. Um, sure. I was very interested in what you said that you were connected, uh, uh, that CNN connected you and with you and uh, they wanted to do this uh, thing live. And I think that this is so exciting. I mean, you started something new and then you got picked up by such a big media. So um, I just wanted to ask you um, how, what was your marketing strategy beforehand to reach the CNN? Um, so, so for, so what we did was um, when we started, we, we had a very clear um, idea that we wanted to make sure that we were on all major social media platforms. So we wanted to have a Twitter presence because Twitter is very important for our market. We wanted to have an Instagram presence because we wanted people to see what we were creating. Um, and we wanted to have a YouTube channel so that we could always have kind of a record of what we've been doing uh, with um, Africa Podfest, right? And uh, for the, the last choice was, you know, we, we still need to have a, a, a meta page, Facebook at the time. And because Facebook is a really big part of how people connect with the internet across Africa. And I don't know if this is the case for markets that you've experienced, but we really needed to make sure we had a uh, Facebook presence, Meta Now. And um, so they approached us actually through our Facebook page and said, hey, we heard you guys are having this event. <laughs> can we get your email address and then you know, we can connect with you? So I don't know how they heard about us. Maybe they have really good researchers. Um, but also we, you know, we, we, we try and, we try and, um, you know, like how we're having this conversation, we try and speak to, um, all types of groups of people in the podcast community. And so we talk to traditional media, we talk to uh, students, we talk to, um, conferences. So, for example, next week uh, I'll be speaking at the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum, which is massive for media. It's a really big platform. Um, but because we mix our outreach in so many ways, we don't know which one will make most sense. Like, we never know who's in the room. Sometimes people tell us, I listened to your talk uh, on this date, I came to this particular meetup. And we say, but we didn't see your name in the sign up. And they say, oh, I don't usually sign up. I usually use an alias, you know, uh, a fake name to sign up for webinars. I don't like signing up for webinars with my credentials. So I usually use this kind of throwaway account. And so you never know because you, you do publicly accessible work. The public has access to it at all times. Um, and so I, I like to say, there are people who can tell you how to do a really good marketing strategy, but I don't know who can put you in the, you know, kind of like the universe of somebody or an organization that you really want to access, except, you know, so the more we did what we wanted to do, the more people said, this really makes sense for me. So it's like, if you do what you want to do, because again, maybe you don't have the funding to do everything, but you do the, with the funding you have, you do exactly what you want to do we found that people who also resonate with this concept and resonate with your work will come and find you. 
because you're in the public somewhere in the world. You know, we're what, almost 8 billion people, but the people who are looking for you will find you um, where you are. That being said, um, we do try and uh, make regular um, contact. So we have a newsletter every month that's on Substack. Uh, we do um, partner with different organizations that are focused on our region to do this. Um, we do try and, um, you know, we do build partnerships with organizations and try and spread out our resources and partner as much as possible um, so that our combined reach can go further. We um, we do so many so many different things on a marketing scale that if I could pick one, I'd say just do whatever it is you want, <laughs> like with your whole heart or your whole resources, and just say you know like whoever comes will come. Like it's like setting out a table and you say you know what, if you're hungry you come and eat. If it's not your type of food, then you know you'll say no thank you and you'll kind of you know you won't go to the webinar or the event. So I hope that helps you. Okay, I have another question. Do you host your own podcast? And uh, if you do, can you tell us more about it? Or if you're not, why you don't have your own podcast? Because we know that everybody has their own podcast nowadays. Okay. Um, so we have our own podcast. It's called the Semanasi podcast. Semanasi is two words uh, in Kiswahili, which means talk with us. And it's a podcast about um, where we, it's an interview podcast where we talk to different people who are in the African podcast space about what they're doing. So it's more like the industry is so new that not many people understand who else is doing what, you know, where are they located? Are they a studio? Are they a festival organizer? So we featured um, people who teach podcasting. For example, we had somebody who teaches podcasting at the University of um, American University in Cairo, who also uh, started PodFest Cairo. We have uh, people who started the first Francophone uh, African podcast festival. We featured them. We featured podcast platforms, um, two of them. One is AfriPods, which is uh, focused on Africa. The other one is uh, Jamit, which is also focused on Africa. We've also featured studio um, studio um, producers who are working on the African podcast uh, continent. So we try and create a balance of opinion because if you listen to me, I have one opinion and it's great to me to have this opinion, but it's much more important if you have many more voices, if you have the kind of platform we have, we try and be a little bit responsible and give people opinions, even if necessarily, we don't necessarily have that experience, we try and get someone who has that experience and that country and regional experience to be able to share this. Um, the second thing that we do, we don't, uh, we do appear on other people's podcasts occasionally um, for two reasons. One, uh, we are not public figures per se. Um, you know, I don't have a, what do you call it, a nation that, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a politician, I'm not a, um, this kind of, you know, I'm a, I'm a business person. I'm, I'm interested in how, you know, the commercial, how to make podcasting commercially viable. Um, and so sometimes it's interesting to talk with podcasters who are trying to understand how to develop their own community or how to develop their own festival, or maybe they're interested in some aspect of how we operate. Um, for example, um, we, you know, my co-founder and I will do occasionally appear on other people's podcasts that are talking about in topics that are kind of resonant and also maybe to reach new audiences as well. So we talk with, um, you know, sometimes think tanks, sometimes um, we talk with um, media podcasts, sometimes we talk at festivals, sometimes we talk at conferences and those recordings similar to this recording sometimes are used in podcasts. So if we don't create, you know, we, we have our own um, and what we've done uh, with that podcast is really try and use it to help people understand, you know, from a production perspective, if they can produce across the continent, if they can work with, you can find talent anywhere. And so we are also trying to kind of let people know that you can produce and have great producers who have the context. And so, you know, if we're coming to, for example, do a podcast in Bulgaria, we're not going to come with a crew that's not understanding the context, that's not kind of like, understanding what the um, topics are, what the technical capabilities are. We really try and work in that country with people who are from that country or from that region um, in terms of developing our podcasts. 
Okay, one question from me. Um, it's related to what's what's your impression? What is the well working method to increase the audience of a podcast? You you have uh, you have impressions from from different podcasts there as mm -hmm. as you do a podcasting festival. Yeah. So most probably you know some uh, well working methods or models how to increase the audience yeah. in a time as now it is uh, where where there is a lot of content. Everyone is producing content. And it's hard sure. to, to get in front. And if I can add just to this question, because I know that you shared with us that you are currently based in Germany. I mean, uh, can you tell us also about the international community and the international audience that you, you have? Thank you. Um, so two questions. Uh, one is how to increase your audience in this current context and uh, maybe what our international audience looks like. Yeah, okay. So the first part um, in... Uh, you know, one, the, the podcasts that are doing really well in Africa, um, one are, in, so a lot of them are influencer driven. They're people who already had a huge, for example, social media platform. And so when they said, I'm developing a podcast, they kind of were able to draw their audience into their podcast. Uh, the second part is if they're controversial, there's a couple of podcasts, which I don't want to give them, you know, additional press, but um, they can be quite controversial. And so they get a lot of people who want to follow them based on that. Um, and so my advice is if you want to go that route, there are some good examples, you know, of people who have done that, you know, be controversial and try and be an influencer and do that. For um, podcasters that are doing story-driven podcasts, so people who are really crafting their podcast, they're using, um, you know, really technical formats, they're creating, um, you know, very rich audio experiences, they're investing a lot of time, and they're independent, meaning they're not necessarily attached to an organization, a lot of them what they try and do is um, there's one really great one. Uh, it's called Nipe Story. So N-I-P-E is the first uh, word. And the second word is S-T-O-R-Y. And it's a story podcast where different um, voice actors and artists read these stories that come from different African countries. So the producer is based in Kenya, but then the stories come from different African countries from different uh, authors of different stories. And also the actors are very, you know, evocative and they give this really rich picture of what's happening in the story. So that podcast, um, the one, the person who is the producer of the podcast comes from a media background, but also is very much connected to the story world. So as, is a storyteller, is involved in arts and culture and so has existing networks there but also it's very very well produced and so the podcast itself when you listen to it you want to listen to more episodes um, it also addresses um, both uh, popular and unpopular topics so you find a lot of people feel like it's very balanced and they come back to it time and again and give reviews so I found like for podcasts like that which um, they have a really great background, a great story, but they're not necessarily from a very well-known podcast region. They become well-known among people who are looking, for example, for long story podcasts, or, you know, they're looking for a specific type of content. For, um, for interview podcasts, like the African market right now has a lot of interview uh, format podcasts. And it's, it's easy to see, um, you know, why that's popular because that's where a lot of people are asked. There's a lot of information that's not really widely available about so many different topics um, about Africa. So a lot of people are filling in the gaps in terms of information. And so, um, you know, for example, people who have technical information to do with medicine, to do with law, to do with uh, engineering, to do with um, overland travel. If you have a specific niche topic, that is not easy to get that information, then those podcasts get their audience because 
you look for them and you only find their podcasts. There's a um, an interesting podcast that was there. I'm not sure if they're still producing this year. And it's a podcast about astronomy in Africa. And so it's two astronomers who talk about what they see in the sky at night, you know, with the stars and whatever else they see kind of going on above the African continent. So that's really, you know, niche driven. And that's the kind of podcast that, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, really looking at audience, it will have a specific audience. It may not be a mass audience. So you have to, um, for you to grow your um, podcast, at, at least in Africa, you have to kind of decide if you're going to be a niche podcast, okay, um, how do you then tailor your content to reach that? That being said, um, traditional marketing channels, you know, and they say traditional and, and so, you know, sort of more digital channels also work as well um, in terms of getting to your audience. Some people buy access, so they advertise uh, using, um, you know, the social media platform ads and they kind of buy um, FaceTime with people when they have new episodes. Um, I've seen people use billboards. So literally like put your podcast on a billboard in a major um, African city. And many people will see it that way because maybe that's their route to commute. Um, there are other people who also, um, you know, try and you, you can grow your audience. Like we've grown our audience by partnerships. And so every partner kind of does promotion for the podcast in their own way. So the production team uses their platform. Our team uses our platform. Um, and so that's one way that we've grown. Um, and then also through events. So um, people who launch their podcast on Africa Podcast, they get a huge kind of boost because people are looking for African podcasts. So um, that's another way that audiences grow. In our audience for our work, we found um, on an international level, we have people who join our events from every continent. Um, as long as they can be awake, they will be in the room, you know, because they are, um, they've been virtual events, um, at least for the last couple of years. So we have, um, at least from the US and Canada, and, you know, anyone who's got sort of reasonable time zone, EU, Anyone who's in that reasonable time zone will join. But we've also had people who join us from um, South Asia and specifically India. Um, we've had people join us from um, Australia. We've had people join from different parts of the world, but we definitely have about over 50 countries represented in our audience so far. Um, and not necessarily on the African continent, but beyond. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I would say the international audience is. I would say um, because a lot of the growth in major podcasts is coming from the news world, a lot of traditional news outlets are developing podcasts um, for the African continent. And they've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, RFI had a podcast. I think they still have it that's focused on Africa with um, stories coming from different African countries. Um, they launched uh, that uh, at Africa Podcast Day. Um, and I think... Now, for example, outlets like the BBC, for example, have uh, switched their main Africa program focused on Africa to a podcast format from a radio format. And so that's um, one way that, um, you know, we've seen an, a more international audience grow for um, Africa focused podcasts. Um, I would say for us, um, because we've spent a lot of time and energy developing uh, Africa-focused content, we find that people who are curious about the commercial opportunity in Africa gravitate towards our resources. And I mean, like our um, website, our uh, publications, our events, our, um, like if we do a Twitter space or something like that, or an Instagram live or anything like that, they'll come and they'll engage using those platforms. Um, and so that's kind of how we, we've, we've grown our international audience as well. Um, but we are a primarily Anglophone uh, company. That's our main strength. So we've not reached, uh, for example, the full Fre French speaking uh, audience for African podcasts or Arabic speaking or Kiswahili speaking. So it's, and it's a huge geographic area. So we can only, 
maybe start to say that others should come in and do similar work. So do regional studies, do like regional marketing research and those kinds of opportunities. Um, but yeah, that's where we are with our international audience. Thank you so much for that. I see that we're just close to one hour and I, I wouldn't like to take more of your time because we were right late <laughs> at the beginning. So if anyone has any questions, if not, I, I want to ask you, Josephine, if it's possible to stay two minutes more with us, with me and Sasha, just for some more yeah. just um, uh, yeah, questions. Oh, sure. sure. Um, uh, I have a question for everyone here. Um, I would love to listen to your podcast, even if it's not necessarily... Um, in uh, a language I speak, uh, please could you share uh, the links to everyone's podcast? I'd really like to get a feel of what you're creating as well. Um, and I'm really interested to hear um, more about um, the festival. So if you have some more information about the festival, um, that'd be really cool as well. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I know everybody has things to do, places to be. So I don't, um, you know, I don't take it lightly that you want to spend some time thinking about and creating community around your podcasts. And um, oh yeah, and the last thing is we're at Africa Podfest. So if you have um, any uh, time or you spend any time on social media, that's where we are. Um, you can always find different kinds of things on there and find different podcasts that, you know, you may not necessarily have discovered. And our website is podcasting.africa. That's our, uh, that's our main website. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If if you if that's okay for you, after the conversation, I can send you first links to everyone's podcast in our network. Yeah. And also, yeah. Uh, more information about the festival that I mentioned that's uh, been happening here. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Then thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone and to you, Josephine. If you just we can just stay two more minutes after after. Okay. The... Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very inspirational to hear your story. Thank you very much. Thank you.